Welcome, 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 welcome. And one more welcome for everyone out there. Part of our continuing series where we talk to professors, reporters, writers, columnists, activists, anybody on the left, anybody on the right, anybody with a thoughtful perspective. We want to provide their perspective directly to you, the public, unedited and unaltered, so that you could do this thing that I used to do in high school called Think for Yourself. Maybe it'll be popular again. Maybe it won't. With us today is Mark Mizrucky. That's Mark Mizrucky. Uh, and it is our privilege to have him. Professor Ms. Rucky is the Robert Cooley Angel uh, Collegiate Professor of Sociology. He works in politics and social change, social networks, work economy, organization, sociology at the University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Ms. Rucky's research focuses on the economic and political behavior of large American corporations, as well as the methods of social network analysis. His primary current project is a study of the changing nature of the American corporate elite from the period immediately after World War II to the present. He is also involved in a study of the globalization of American banking and a study of methods for measuring the effects of social network ties. He teaches courses on economic sociology, sociological theory, social networks, and statistical methods. Uh, some of the books or works that he's published was the Fraction, Fractioning of the American Corporate Elite, uh, by Harvard University Press, very impressive. The Structure of Corporate Political Action, Interfirm Relations and Their Consequences by Harvard, again. The American Corporate Network by Sage, also a good publication. And Intercorporate Relations, Structural Analysis of Business by Cambridge University Press, also reputable. Uh, some of the articles were Elite Fragmentation and the Decline of the United States. We're going to be touching on that today. And the Decline of the American Corporate Network, 1960 to 2010. And this is the article where we found the professor. But before we get into that, let's check in. Uh, professor, how'd I do? Do we need to correct anything? Did I mispronounce anything? Uh, is there new material that we need to provide? That was beautiful and overly generous. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we pronounced it right, Ms. Rocky. Yep. Okay. And it is not a Japanese last name like I thought. So I was mistaken on that. Apologies. Um, so... Here's this article. It's called Large Corporations Contributed to Our Political Polarization. Here's How They Can Fix It. Um, October 7th, 2020. What it says is before approaching this question, we must clear up an important misconception. There is widespread belief that both the Republican and Democratic parties have become more extreme in recent years. Both sides are to blame, we repeatedly hear. It is certainly true that neither of our two major parties is perfect, nor is either immune from responsibility to our current state. To assume that they are equally extreme and intransigent is not true. However, the graph below compiled by Professor Keith T. Poole at the University of Georgia shows the average political positions of, on a conservative liberal scale of Democratic and Republican members of the House of Representatives since 1879. And there's the chart right there. And you can see around 1979 ish right before 1981 the red line is republicans and yes you do have uh purple southern democrats blues democrats you do have a slight decrease in the 79 81 position for democrats it drops a little bit but it's nowhere comparable to this line of red starting around 78 79 going up to 2011, which is the Republicans. And that's what we're talking about. So you did have some change where the Democrats moved to the left more, but you really had a dramatic change of the Republicans moving much further to the right. Uh, the question is, what accounts for this increasing extremism of the Republican Party and the polarization that has resulted from it? I argue that it stems from what many view as an unlikely source of decline in leadership by large American corporations, a group I refer to as the American corporate elite. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But first, uh, Professor, could you tell us um, why did you write this article? Why did you think this was a worthwhile thing to write about or study and publish in 2020? 2020? And before you answer, if you could uh, talk to me like I have been living in a cave for the last 10 years. I don't know what's going on. And if you could speak both as an academic and as just a regular American with two working eyeballs, what's going on in 2020? Is polarization an issue? Why even look at this in 2020? Do we have any problems or is everything perfect in America? Well, I hardly know where to start. Uh, 
Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you go back 50, uh, 50, 60, 70 years and you look at the American political system, you know, we had Democrats and Republicans. We, they were fighting all the time. They disagreed with each other. There was, there was conflict. It's not as if it was some kind of utopia. But they generally, particularly with, on major issues, did work together. They tried to work things out. They tried to compromise. And they often came up with good solutions. I think the feeling was among members of both parties that you had to deliver for your constituents. And so even if that meant working with the other party, if you passed a, a law that your a bill that your constituents supported, you could go back home and tell them what you did. So if you look, for example, at the vote on the Medicare bill in 1965, what you see is that in both the House and the Senate, even though this was a Democratic bill, it was a liberal bill, clearly, um, virtually half of the senators and members of the House in the Republican Party voted yes on the bill for Medicare. If you go 40 years later um, to Obamacare, not a single Republican in either the House or the Senate voted yes. So, and, and what you see now, what we observe today is the two parties can rarely accomplish anything together until, you know, maybe when they're pressed into an extreme desperation, such as the, uh, the debt ceiling crisis of just a few weeks ago, eventually they come up with something. But the, the, the Republicans and the Democrats seem to be unable to agree on anything today. And they seem to be much farther apart. They seem unable to compromise. And the constituencies are also much more polarized. So you have things like people. Really? Yeah, the public, members of the public saying, you know, I would uh, I would be upset if my child, you know, if some Democrat saying I'd be upset if my child married a Republican and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Something you didn't see you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So this polarization is real. And the question is, where did it come from and what is what's contributing to it and what is perpetuating it? And that's what this article is about. The, the article picks up on the book that I published in 2013, The Fracturing of the American Corporate Elite. And it's basically, I basically make the same argument, but I update it to take into account more recent events. And I have some policy recommendations at the end, which I'm sure you can. Um, awesome. About. But that's the basic story that if you look at the, the last 60, 70 years of American politics, there's been this enormous change in the way our politics operate. Uh, much to the for the worse, in my view. How far back? Um, this is a question I always ask people. But how far back did this polarization go? And and not not that you have the definitive answer, but can you tell us when you obviously you've lived for a while? Obviously, you've lived in America for a while. Uh, could you tell us when you go? Oh, that's that's different. Um, it wasn't like that before. I remember how we used to not do that last year, and now we're definitely doing it this year. Uh, was it in 2020 that you first noticed a shift in polarization um, and you didn't notice anything before? Or were there red flags that appeared in your consciousness far before the year 2020? Okay, well, yeah, it's a great question. I think there are two key events, both of which occurred well before 2020, that, that really triggered what we see now. The first is, and you can see from that chart, that right around 1980, the Republican Party began to shift significantly to the right. Now, this was part of a, a, an outcome of a number of things that occurred during the 1970s that I can, I'd be happy to talk about in more detail. But for now, let, let's just let me just point out that around 1980, you do start to see this significant shift to the right among the Republicans. But even when that occurred, you still, there was still a reasonable consensus in the federal government uh, that allowed parties to work together. The second key event that occurred was in 1994, when the Republicans gained control of Congress. 
for the first time, they had had the Senate in 19, from 1981 to 1987, but then lost it back to the Democrats. The Republicans had not held the House since the early 1950s. But in 1994, they swept into control of both the Senate and the House. And the new House Speaker, Newt Gingrich, had decided we need a new uh, mode of operation. And what he urged his Republican colleagues to do is to stop cooperating with the Democrats. It's stealth politics now. They're the enemy. Whatever they say, it's almost, you know, John Boehner a few years later made a quote that was almost identical to Mao Zedong in the Little Red Book, where he said, whatever Clinton, whatever, whatever Clinton is for, we oppose. Whatever he's against, we're for. And that oh, was the yeah. attitude that they took. Yeah. Um, so no more cooperating, no more compromising. It's we have our position, we're holding to it, and that's the way it's going to be. And it, that really changed the, the atmosphere in Washington. And, um, you know, everything that happened after that, I think, was just, um, you know, was part, part of a trend that had really started when Gingrich took over. And so, um, you know, by the time we get to 2016 and 2020, uh, that was just the culmination of a process that had been going on for decades. So the Trump and 2016 is a culmination of this event in 1984. Uh, 19, well, 1980 roughly. And, and then 1994. 19, yeah, rough, okay. Yeah, and I'd heard about Newt Gingrich before, um, and I agree with you. There certainly was, there's a lot of people saying there was an increase in polarization in the 1970s. Um, I struggle to, but I struggle to see any evidence of that other than at the highly elite levels until you get to roughly the 1990s. Uh, but the question for, but it, it, so you still had Ronald Reagan in the 1980s and he was still very partisan and he was very partisan and very pro-Republican and very anti-Democrat. And he would routinely, uh, make fun of the Democrats and poke at them. But at the end of the day, he'd always work with um, Tip O'Neill, the Democrat, and they would always come up with legislation. And both of them felt we've got to actually get laws passed. I mean, I can't just come up here and talk trash against the other guy. I mean, eventually I need to get some things done so I can go back and run on that. And we seem to have lost that. We seem to have kept the partisanship of Reagan, but forgot his relationship with Tip O'Neill and the fact that they actually worked together at the end of the day and got some things done. Despite what they did on camera, Reagan was a very big partisan, but he would also, add, and I'm not a huge fan of Reagan, I'm just saying there was a time where you had partisanship, but things still worked. And we seem to have lost that um, recently. When, when did you notice in your personal life? Um, at what state do you live in right now, Professor? I live in Michigan, but I've okay. lived in several states. Okay. Where were you living in 2016? Here. I've been okay. in Michigan since the early 90s. Okay. When did you know this? Because so, one thing you said that I, I, I love is that the people themselves are polarized. It's not just the elites. When did you notice the people being polarized in Michigan? Where you're like, wow, we used to be able to get along and now... You know, Joe at the corner store, I can't even talk to him anymore. Was it with Trump? Was it before Trump? Or was it a couple of years after Trump? I've heard some people saying it was Obama. I've heard some people saying, no, you got to wait till 2020. When did when did it impact you in your life? That's a very interesting question. And I think in some ways my answer will will show you the extent to which this is occurring. Please, please. I I have very little interaction in my life with people who are not uh, who don't share my political views. Um, there are some exceptions. One of my wife's close friends, um, there are a couple who are um, very strongly Republican to the point they don't love Donald Trump, but they support him strongly. They watch Fox News. Um, I will concede I'm a Democrat. I'm not, you know, what? No, point, no point denying that. Um, but we are very, very close friends with them and they are the most generous, <laughs> unselfish, decent people I've known in my entire life. These are people who would give you the shirt off their back. Um, 
that relationship is increasingly rare. Okay. I can't think of, I, bless you. I, I can't think of any other people I interact with with any degree of regularity who don't broadly share my political perspective. I mean, I have differences. I work in a university and I've got issues with a lot of the things that are going on in the university now. But, you know, those are, we're all, when when all said and done, we're all going to vote for, for Joe Biden next year. You know, I mean, it's, we, we, and we all share certain kinds of sentiments about the, the, the existing political order. And I think, and so, you know, you asked me, when did I notice this personally? I can't say that I did notice it personally, but, but, but I think what's happened is that there are people who have in the past interacted. You have families where there are members within the same family who don't share the same politics. And sure. What I'm my based on my understanding, because I don't observe this, everybody I'm related to shares my political views, too. Right, right. So but what I've read, what I've seen is that now there are big fights within families. People no longer talk to Uncle Joe and, you know, and and Aunt Sally and and, you know, it has split people apart and it's affected married couples. I mean, this. so I don't see it in my own daily personal life. But I certainly I read about it. I hear about it. Um, and I believe it just w- watching the politics. Um, it doesn't surprise me that these sorts of things would happen. And you live a sordid life yourself going off the political sociological term, meaning that you're with other Democrats and you roughly have similar political ideas at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, in universities, I mean, this is one of the criticisms of that, that conservatives make today. Right. And that universities have become monolithically liberal and democratic places. And, you know, I think that there's definitely some truth to that. I, huh? I, I, you know, and, and I'm in a field sociology where there's especially pronounced. I can't say I don't know the politics of every single member of my department, but I would be shocked if there's a single faculty member in my department who's who's a Republican. I just don't, that seems inconceivable to me. So Republicans and conservatives aren't whack job crazy for saying, seems like the universities are all leftists. There's some truth. Yeah, now that. saying they're left, that's a little trickier, you know, to say okay. they're leftists, that makes it sound like they're, you know, they're all they're, radicals. And they're that, Democrats. They're on the left. Yeah, they're not on the yeah. right. You see differences. I mean, there okay. are people who okay. are much more left. And, and, you know, some of the surveys suggested as many as 40 percent or more of current university faculty um, def- describe themselves as left as opposed to liberal. Wow. So, you know, it's not they're not making this up. No. But it does mean that we don't. And I think they've also got a legitimate point that, you know, you put a bunch of liberals together in one place and there are certain arg- arguments and ideas that don't get raised. And I think that the views and the arguments that that the people in those situations uh, develop become soft because they're not being directly challenged. And there's a, there are certain assumptions that we all make that we don't question. And that bothers me a lot, even though, you know, I consider myself, you know, I'm a Democrat and I consider myself a liberal. It, it does. I am sympathetic with the conservatives who complain about this monolithic ideological uh, perspective that dominates, particularly in, in elite universities, um, you know, which is, you know, of which I'm a member, you know, it's uh, now having said that, there are, there's also a range of conservative positions and some of them are, you know, I don't believe that somebody should be teach, teaching in a university who can't accept the fact that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. Like, you know, there are positions that the Republicans have become so extreme today that there are people who are so far out there, and this is a significant element of the party, that no, they don't belong in a in an institute of higher learning. So I understand that. But but on the other hand, there are people who have who question certain liberal assumptions, uh, whose views are, really aren't represented to the extent that I think they could be, and should be. 
Lee Jessam and Corey Clark were two researchers who had brought up um, that, you know, a lot of the social science researchers, a lot of the social scientists who look at political polarization, almost all of them are liberal, almost zero conservatives who have published on the subject in the last 10 years or are of any repute. And what I question is, is I understand that the Republican Party moved further to the right. I get it. But what I'm wondering is, I hear so much about bias in the field, academically, of uh, political polarization. And then I also hear a lot of people who study this field go, well, you know, a lot of people say it's on both sides. That's wrong. It's really all the Republicans' fault. And I'm wondering, if we admit that there's so much liberal bias in this field, should we be somewhat cautious of so many researchers in the field also coming to the conclusion that basically it's all the Republicans' fault? I think it's a great question, um, but my answer would be no. Okay. I, I do believe that this chart that you're showing right here, I, I you know, I, I, I hope that I've conveyed in my last few responses that I really am, am making the best effort I can to, to look at things in a balanced way. What, regardless of whatever positions I hold personally. And I do believe that this is objectively true, what you see in this graph. Now, what I will say is, I think on some of the social and cultural issues, I do believe that Democrats in, on, on average have moved to the left in recent years. Um, Having you know a lot of the a lot of the issues around um, race and gender and rights for LGBTQ people, on some of those issues, I do believe that uh, liberals have moved to the left, and I don't think that that is picked up by this graph. On economic issues, on the other hand, if you look at the positions that most Democrats, and by the way, that group within the Democratic Party still, I don't believe, represents a majority of Democrats. I think it's a significant minority of Democrats that has pushed the overall party slightly to the left, again, on social and cultural issues. But I think if you look at economic positions, the, the Democratic Party today is probably to the right of where Lyndon Johnson was in the 1960s. If you look at actual policy, and I can give you examples there, they're in the paper that you were referring to earlier, that policy, Richard Nixon came out with a health care plan in 1973, 74, mm -hmm. that was more liberal than what either Bill Clinton or Barack Obama ultimately proposed. Good point. Good point. And Good so point. that's an indication that um, that's an indication of how far our politics have moved in the last 50 years. I, yeah, I just wonder because um, obviously January 6th, obviously Trump, obviously Trump not acknowledging that his uh, competitor won an election. Horrible, horrible extremist behaviors shocked and horrified me. And I, uh, one party's doing that and another party isn't doing that, of course. Yeah. At the same time, though, um, I have to say, I remember when Barack Obama came out against gay marriage. A lot of people don't like to remember that, but his first term, he was not for it. He shifted. Um, so that's a big shift as a party because you actually had Obama not for it, and then he had to change his opinion and act like he was after Gavin Newsom started marrying people here in California. Uh, the ground was shifting under Obama's feet. So we can tell that there was a position of the Democratic Party and that it did shift. And I wonder, I live in the Central Valley. It's one of the last competitive voting districts in all of America. Almost all of America is broken up into what they call landslide voting counties, where people win, either Democrats win by 20 percentage points or Republicans win by 20 percentage points. We don't have many competitive districts anymore. This was in the book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort. The Central Valley is one of the last remaining places where Democrats might win by 52%, and then the next year, a Republican might win by 52%. It's somewhat competitive. That almost doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, but I, I, I got to say, like, you know, when I talk to people here and I go, transgender story time. And I have helped transgender people run for office 
and I have helped LGBTQIA people run for office, and I am very proud as a Californian that we have the highest rate of transgender and LGBTQ people in our state of almost any recognized government space on the earth. Very proud of that. But when I talk to average parents and I go, transgender story time and Dylan Mulvaney on a Bud Light can, they don't think that's not radical. They think that's a massive shift to the left. And yet we never hear about that. And so I wonder, is it fair to say just the right move to the left? Because when you talk to a lot of average parents, they won't go around saying this because they don't want to seem like bigots, but they're not exactly on board with some things they feel as being pushed to the culture war. And I'm in one of the last remaining moderate grounds in all of America. Uh, people are not saying, oh, it's just the right. They're saying the left seems a little extreme too. And then I come back to, we have an admitted bias in the research field. And I'm just wondering, are we seeing everything? Part of the issues that get me is I've asked 30 different researchers. The Republican Party did January 6th. Horrible. The Republican Party denied that Biden won the election. Horrible. Awful. Bad for democracy. But we also have a federal court proving in 2016 that the Democratic Party lied to all their voters and said, yes, we did pick Hillary over Bernie Sanders. And yes, we did prioritize her. This came out in a federal court because Bernie Sanders people um, sued them. And the Democratic Party admitted basically, yeah, we lied. We told everybody it's up to a uh, competition of the two people. And secretly, we picked Hillary because we can do that. That's also horrible for democracy. I have yet to meet many liberal professors who are even aware that happened or are aware of the Durham report. The Durham report came out recently. It's by a full federal investigation. Nobody has denied that it was unfair or wrong or done incorrectly. They just don't cover it. The Durham report says basically Hillary Clinton lied with the FBI on the Russian collusion thing. She paid for the Steele dossier and she misused the entire federal security system. That also can't be good for democracy. But when I talk to liberal professors about these two events, they go, I haven't heard of that. I, I can't talk about that. Now, let's go back to how most of the problem is the Republicans. And I'm as an outsider looking in, I'm like, that that looks a little bit like bias. Am I way off base for thinking that? No, I don't think you're way off base. There was an article in this morning's New York Times by Frank Bruni. Uh, I don't remember the exact title, but it was something like, I actually saw it a couple of days ago because I received his email feed. It's okay for Democrats to criticize Hunter Biden, I think was the. Nice. Or maybe it was Joe Biden. I don't remember. Um, but he was making a point very similar to what you're making that, look, and, and I, I would be the first to tell you this. The Democrats are not exactly angels. They're politicians. They want to win. They're That's all I'm saying. That's they're, all I'm saying. Yeah. They're cutthroat. And they say things, you know, some of these positions that people take for granted in the Democratic Party, I think. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, Medicare fraud, welfare fraud. I don't know how common. Well, Medicare fraud is pretty common. I don't know how common welfare fraud is. And, you know, even if it's there's a non-negligible negligible amount of it, that to me would not justify scrapping the programs because a few people cheat the system. But to deny it altogether that there are some people out there who cheat the system, that's, that's just, that's a problem. And I do think that among that liberals in that respect can be as bad as, as uh, the far right in terms of just being unwilling to acknowledge certain things. So I'm not going to sit here and defend the Democrats and say, oh, they're, uh, you know, they're a party of angels who have never uh, committed any abhorrent or anti-democratic kinds of uh, acts. I mean, they're, they're far from perfect. I do think, however, that it's still not a, a symmetric situation. Okay, when a Democrat loses, when's the last time you heard a Democrat lose the race? Yeah, there were some people in 2004 who claimed that John Kerry got robbed, that there were, 
irregularities in Ohio and he should have won Ohio, but it was never taken seriously. John Kerry himself never challenged the election. Um, you know, it just does not happen where you've got a significant and you've got anybody really in the party refusing to acknowledge they lost an election. Whereas on the other side, you've got, you've got the, the best you see among, among um, some of the less extreme Republicans is they just won't come right out and say, yes, the election was stolen. They're just silent on it. But, you know, it's just not symmetric. And then the other thing, point I want to make is we haven't really talked. We've talked a little bit about the culture, the culture wars and some of these cultural issues. And, you know, I, I would agree that some some uh, elements of the left are pushing some of these issues too fast, too far in ways that are counterproductive. But I but another point to make is that the entire country has moved left on on most of these. Sure. So gay rights. Sure. I mean, even even Republicans, for the most part, it's today, not an issue anymore. Yeah. I, mean, I remember not too long ago when, uh, you know, even liberals would routinely, some people would say, yes, there should be, uh, um, uh, I don't even remember what the term was, you know, before there was gay marriage, you could have, you could have civil unions, I think they were called, uh, that that would be okay, but they shouldn't be allowed to marry each other. And then, you know, that became, and Joe Biden's the one who pushed, as vice president, is the one who pushed Obama into finally acknowledging support for gay marriage. So people have moved significantly in that direction. I don't know what's going to happen with trans rights in the future, but I suspect that over time we will see the general population moving toward greater acceptance as well. But, you know, so, so, but where, where the differences are is in economic policy, Fair. which, you know, we're not talking about that at all. Not just you and I, but the, the news doesn't talk about it really. So the differences in polarization are really at the economic level? No, no. I think that there's a lot of the polarization is in the cultural and social issues, which is where I, as I mentioned, I think the Democrats probably have moved a little more to the left in ways that don't show up on this chart. But I think on economic issues is, is where this chart really um, captures what's happened because you, the Republican, um, Republic, even, you know, if you go back again, go back to the 1970s, when Gerald Ford was president, um, he came out at the time inflation was a huge problem, much more serious than what we've experienced in the last year or so. And for Gerald Ford comes out with this admittedly kind of ridiculous concept of whip inflation now, W-I-N, and he proposed people wear these buttons that say win, and somehow wearing these buttons will help us whip inflation. You know, and it was widely ridiculed. But if you look at the speech where President Ford introduced that idea, you'll see that he made a series of proposals that virtually no Democrat, even on the left of the party, is making today. For right. example, um, he proposed a government jobs program to hire 160,000 government workers to deal with the recession. Do you hear any Democrat saying the government should hire? Well, you know, we have full employment now, but uh, you didn't hear, you didn't even hear Obama saying that when he, when we were at the height of the financial crisis. Uh, he Ford, let me just make one more point. Ford also suggested that a, a tax cut exclusively for middle and lower income taxpayers to be financed by a windfall profits tax on oil companies. Okay. This is a Republican president in the mid 1970s. Is any Democrat today proposing not even, I don't even hear Bernie talking about a windfall profits tax. So, I mean, that's, you know, in terms of economic issues, things have really moved to the right. And again, this is, this has been driven primarily um, by Republicans. That I totally, totally, no question at all. Um, 
I have heard repeatedly that the Republican Party today, even if Nixon had a great reputation and even if he did win Vietnam, he would never be voted as a Republican today and neither would Ronald Reagan because they said things like, let's pay back the Japanese for internment and let's acknowledge the Latinos live here in California. And, and both let's support would, immigration. And let's support immigration. Reagan and, and George let's, Bush uh, Senior you know, and let's dating. have... Uh, yeah. yeah, let's have wild parks that are preserved for the environment. Both of them did that. Both of them reached out for minorities. Both of them. A lot of things you just would not see today. Like, let's pay reparations to some group. I don't see that going anywhere with the Republicans. But Reagan, it was important to him. Maybe it's political, but he pushed that part. Say what you will about Reagan, but he was about pushing that issue. A lot of his people didn't even back him up. But he said that uh, we need to give the Japanese reparations. We, what we did was wrong. And I understand it's not the amount of money they deserve, but we need to do something. We can't just let this sit here and act like it's going to go away. That was all Reagan. You'd never see that today. Well, so. in fairness, um, there was a recent Supreme Court ruling uh, str that fr strongly favored Native Americans. And, and mm -hmm. Neil Gorsuch has proven repeatedly that he's very strong in support of, of rights of indigenous Americans. Um, to, to many people's surprise. Sure. Uh, so, you, know, you do see isolated cases like that. But overall, I, I would completely agree with what you were saying. Yes. I'm just saying I agree with you on the economics thing that you had. Mm -hmm. Ford, Nixon, Reagan were doing things that would be seen extremely leftist, liberal financial policies today. Yeah, Reagan, I'm I'm less sure about. In Le case. Well, I just mean the uh, reparations to the Japanese. Yeah. That, Nobody's yeah. going to back up. I'm not talking about the tax cuts or the massive military spending, but the reparations to the Japanese, there is no way in hell that any Republican today could go, let's do reparations, guys, and they're going to go anywhere. That's just going to get shut down quickly. Reagan pushed for it and still kept his popularity. Obviously, he did other things that were super conservative, but if you're talking about how we used to have some conservative Republican presidents who would do a couple – liberal-ish type things occasionally, and now we have none of that, right? They will never suggest any of those things, and that's, I absolutely agree with you. Um, one thing I did want to ask about, though, is that recently it has come out that the Russia did interfere in the 2016 election, and that was wrong and illegal. They had no more than 1% effect on the voting populace, which is within the margin of error. There's a scientific study out now that was all over the news. My question is if the Robert Mueller investigation, the House Select Committee, the Senate Select Committee, all said there was no evidence of collusion. And then we have a report coming out recently that said Russia had no more than 1% influence and margin of error. Why is it okay for liberals to have said from 2016 to 2019, Trump's not my president, he wasn't legitimately elected, and I don't recognize him? Isn't that too close to what Republicans did in 2020 saying, Biden's not my president, I'm not going to recognize him. I don't see him. Evidence has come out, and I have a lot of liberal friends, and I brought this up, and I go, you told me Trump wasn't legitimately elected, not our president, don't need to follow him. Turns out that was a lie. Turns out three to four federal investigations said no truth behind that. I have yet to see any liberal say, boy, I'm sorry for saying the wrong thing that's not backed up by facts for the last four years from 2016 to 2020. I have, I've never seen anyone say that. But yet I've seen all these people say, look at what the Republicans are doing. And I'm like, we have the evidence now that you did the same thing. Can we have that conversation? Well, I, I think with some members of the general public, sure. Um, but look at the look at Hillary. She, there was no when she lost the election, she conceded. End of story. Yes, there were a lot of people who were upset. And by the way, I, I, I do wonder if, if you look at how close Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania were in 2016, if I, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but I'm guessing that a 1% shift uh, could have made the difference in those three states. Abs and, absolutely. So if that's absolutely. true, if it had a 1% effect, that could have actually mattered. Having said that, um, true. yeah, no, li you know, liberals can be just as partisan and uh, as conservatives. And, and uh, yes, they, they, as I said, in 2004, there were people who were trying to claim that, that uh, Ohio was stolen from John Kerry and that right. he should have won the election. So, you know, you do see this. And yeah, I'm, I'm not 
going to, I'm not going to defend that behavior. What you don't see though, and what you didn't see after 2016 is significant elements of the leadership of the Democratic Party refusing to acknowledge the results of the election. Okay. You didn't hear, you know, there were a couple members of Congress, there was even one person, I don't remember who it was, who, who, who did, uh, who tried to, uh, I don't know, formally challenge the results. There was some of that, but I mean, compared to what we saw after 2020. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, just, Republicans vastly far more worse. Yeah. But I'm I mean, if what you're trying that. to say is the Democrats can be in Democrats can be in many cases as bad as the Republicans. Again, I would temper that. Sure. Um, I would say I do believe that that there is a qualitative and quantitative difference. And I, and I but, agree. I agree. You're right that that you can find at behavior by Democrats that is uh, not exactly something I would hold up as as uh, behavior one would one would want to emulate. I'm just saying yes, and I totally agree. The Republicans have moved vastly further to the right on cultural issues and economic issues in comparison to the left. Totally agree with that. And their behaviors are the most extreme and the most dangerous by far compared to anything the left's done. What I'm seeing, though, is that there's a lot of people scared about America tearing itself apart after January 6th. And there's a lot of people saying, how do we fix this? And the number one conclusion is, well, we need to have a conversation with each other and we need to reach out to other people. And the Republicans need to know what they did is wrong. OK, I know a lot of Republicans. And when I start to talk to them about, you know, that stop the steal thing was kind of not good for democracy and you really didn't have the evidence to push it. And you kind of just took what people said. They say, oh, yeah, like with the Dems of 2016 to 2020. And when I can't find any Democrat or any major Democrat to say, yes, we did that. No, it's nowhere as bad as the Republicans, but yes, we did that. No, we shouldn't have done that. There's no Republican willing to buy. Secondly, we had Hillary Clinton for four years saying, Russia did it, Russia did it, Russia did it. And then we had Bill Maher literally went on television, and he's one of the biggest liberals here in California, and he goes, Trump wasn't legitimately elected, Russia made him president. So that idea was absolutely put out there, maybe not by high level elected politicians, but Hillary running around every five minutes saying it's Russia didn't help. There's a lot of people who are on the left don't want to hear it, don't believe it. I don't know about the Durham report. I'm sure Russia rigged the whole election. I don't care about the Mueller report. I don't care about the Senate select report. I don't care about the House intelligence report. I don't care about the Durham investigation. I know what I saw Rachel Maddow say for four years. That's the truth. How do we get to a fixed country? When one half says, you go around punching people, and that's wrong. And they're totally forgot that they too punched people. Can we have an adult conversation as a nation? You know, I'm not optimistic about that on, on the level at which you're uh, describing it. I, I do think there is a potential solution, though, but it's going to require action at the top. And what I argued in that essay that you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation pull that up right now. is that what's missing right now in American politics is that the center right element of the political spectrum is basically empty right now. So if you look at the Democrats, yes, you've got the farther left of the Democratic Party, the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren wing, and then you have a very significant, more centrist element in the Democratic Party, represented by Joe Biden. Joe, you know, Biden is right. He's a centrist. Biden does totally have agree. to answer to the left of the party because he's, you know, that's a significant component of his constituency. But he's also got a very large and probably larger element of his constituency that's closer to the center. If you look that. at the Republican Party they are almost all on the far right. You know, there's so, okay, Kevin McCarthy looks like a pragmatist now compared to Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and uh, Lauren Boebert, but he's not. If you look at his politics, he's every bit as far. He denied Jan 6th. He, he slammed it and then he walked it back. Yeah, he's an right. extremist. 
Right. That's well, insane. I mean, just, also, if you look at his economic policy, he lives ten miles from me. That's insane, man. Right. So what what's missing is unlike the Democratic Party, where you have this far left and you have this more centrist left, the Republican Party it's almost completely far right. Even the people, the the heroes of the you know, people I would consider heroes in the Republican Party, Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, people who had the courage to to actually give up their political careers on principle because they abhorred what was happening to their party. I mean, these are people I have, I can't begin to tell you how much respect and admiration I have for these people who were willing to do that. But if you look at their politics, their positions on issues, they were both also very far to the right. Oh. There really is no, right now, virtually no center-right component in American politics. The group that used to hold that position was the big business community. That's your nexus. That's okay. the group that I write about in okay. this essay. And they played that role in the mid 20th century. We had extremist right wingers in those days. The ones who supported Joe McCarthy, they were, they were, they John were Birch around. Society. John Birch Society. Yeah. California. And it originated in California. Everything originates in California. So I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. I apologize. No, no. Yeah, all of us, I'm sorry. no, listen, I, you know, we, all of us who are not in California owe a great debt to the state because you're the ones who are going to ensure that, that our auto companies have to produce electric cars and, you know, save what's left of the world because, because your market is so big and you're the ones who are, sticking your necks out to do it. So I'm not going to criticize California. But um, but the point is, the, the group that now controls the Republican Party was around back in 1950, 1940s, 50s, and 60s. But they were marginalized. They were considered, okay, Barry Goldwater got nominated in 1964, but he was swamped in a historic landslide. These people were considered extremists, fringe elements, and the group that was played a big role in keeping them out of the mainstream was the big business community, which was much mm. more moderate at the time mm. and controlled the Republican party. And so you look at the administration of Dwight Eisenhower and you look at, you know, Nixon may have been a criminal, but if you look at his policies again, domestically, he could exactly. pass for a liberal Democrat in, in today's. You're right. Uh, I totally agree. Totally agree. And so, so the big business community and the big business community wanted no part of these extreme right wing, wing elements in those days. Now, what happened was in the 1970s, when we began to run into severe economic problems, that's when this system started to fall apart. What happened is the, that's the real key, the key decade. And what happened was the big business leaders started to question some of their own moderate and pragmatic positions because things were moved, had moved pretty far to the left at that point. And they were now, they saw themselves as under siege. They were being hurt by foreign competition. Profits were declining. There was all kinds of social turmoil. Their reputation in the society was declining. And there was a feeling we need to push back. You know, this has gone far enough. And if we don't do something, the entire free enterprise system is going to come apart. And what they did to, to address this is, number one, they, they organized themselves and started moving in a more conservative direction. But the other thing they did that was key is they now began to align themselves with these traditional far right conservatives. And so in the 70s, you see this alliance of big and small business, of the more moderate um, center-right elements of the big business community with the more far-right extreme conservatives. And they pushed the political discourse strongly to the right during the 1970s. So if you look at during the Carter administration, we had a Democratic president we had Democratic control of the Senate and the House. The liberals thought when Carter got in, oh, now we're going to get a consumer protection agency. We're going to get national health care. We're going to get all these things we wanted. Not only did they not get any of those, 
the policies be, became more conservative. There, there were more tax, instead of tax increases on business, there were tax cuts for business. And so everything moved to the right during that decade. And then Reagan gets in in 1980. No. And so things are continuing to move to the right. But what happened was the big business community by that point, when, by the time Reagan gets in, had basically gotten everything they wanted. They had basically demolished the labor movement. They had gained significant tax breaks. They had gained cutbacks in government regulation. They, um, they had delegitimized government in general. And so the public, when I was growing up long before your time, the people saw the government as a good guy. Right. You know, government is here to help you. Well, by the time Reagan got in, no, government's the bad guy now. They are, all they're trying to do is control you. They don't, they don't help. And so what happened is because big business had basically gotten everything they'd wanted by the early 80s, they didn't need to be organized anymore politically. And what you start to see during that decade is they start to go their own way. And you see this in the 1986 tax bill where individual companies were lobbying for for very specific favors, but you didn't have a business-wide collective um, effort to address the, the bill. And then we had the takeover wave of the late 1980s, which basically wiped out one third of the Fortune 500 disappeared during the 1980s. Uh, most of, most of um, them through hostile takeovers. And so now management people, you know, these corporate CEOs who had been these elder statesmen thinking about the long-term implications of, um, you know, their actions for the broader society. Now they were on, you know, they were on this, holding on by the skin of their teeth because next month they could be out because their company's been taken over. They could be out of a job. So there's this tectonic shift that occurs during the 1980s. So when the dust clears by the early 90s, what's happened is that these traditional right-wing elements with whom big business had aligned themselves in the 70s had slowly gained control of the Republican Party. And the big business community was now fragmented and not organized anymore politically. And so they, they in effect, lost control of the, of the Republican Party. And you see this happening very gradually over time in the late 80s through the 1990s. And that's what's happened today. So now what you see is big business. You know, people think, oh, the Republicans are the party of big business. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure about that. You know, they, yes, certainly much of what they do seems to be consistent with the interests of big companies. But a lot of what they do isn't. And so, for example, they it's only because of the Democrats that we got infrastructure. Uh, that we got the infrastructure law. Um, they were not doing anything about it. And there are a whole series of issues that big business cares about a lot. And they can't get through, number one, because they can't organize themselves because they're too fragmented. And number two, because they don't have control of the Republican Party anymore. And so the argument I make is, this center-right space in the American political spectrum that was formerly occupied by the big business community has basically disappeared. And so that's what's led to this extremism in the Republican Party now. And that's also, you know, now their constituency is, is uh, dispossessed rural people who don't, you know, who are not economically affluent um, they're still, you know, the wealthy still will support Republicans, but um, that's not the primary base of the party anymore. And neither is big business. And so to me, that's the biggest reason for the polarization that we see is that the absence, the, the empty space in the center right um, spectrum, the center right space in the political system, political spectrum. And so, you know, my argument is big business has to get its act together and, and reoccupy that space and regain control of the Republican Party. There are a number of groups, by the way, that are work, they're trying to do this. Um, you know, I'm not sure how successful they've been. This Niskanen, the Niskanen Center. I have read about them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's tough to keep it up. There's a group called Leadership Now, former Harvard Business School students. 
Uh, there's a group Business for America. There are a number of groups now trying to do this. And, you know, I've spoken with many of them and they, um, uh, I think they see the problem in a similar way. I don't know how successful they will be in doing this, but I do know that there are a number of business people who are very open to hearing this line of argument. How, okay, I, I know what to do. I know what to do. This is another question I want to ask you, but um, this is an interesting topic. What, let's say you had a magic wand. Um, in fact, don't tell anyone, but I have a magic wand right here. It looks like a normal pin. Trust me, magic wand. I swirl this around and I go, poof! The world immediately changes to the way that I want it. I can have millions of people change their mind culturally instead of 20 years. I can have Congress pass legislation. So I'm virtually handing you this magic wand. If you had this magic wand and you could get 200 million people to think a certain way, Congress to pass whatever legislation, but you only had the power for two years, what would you do to totally fix America? And remember, you basically have the power of God. How do we fix America and get it done in two years? The reason I'm smiling is that I used to have this fantasy many years ago. If I could rule the world, here's what I would do. And I had a very clear sense of what I would do. Guide us, you're, Professor. You're going to be very disappointed when you hear my answer. Please don't say hope. No. What's happened over the years, I, I hate to say it's because I've become older and wiser. You know, that was the old line about the, the former radicals who'd become that just, you know, liberals now and had given up. But I'm no longer sure what I would do. I, I have a sense of the kind of world, the kind of United States I would like to see. And to, to me, the countries that have gotten it right are, in, and, you know, not without problems of their own, but I, I think the Scandinavian countries have gotten it right about how you run a society. Now, you know, it's very easy to say that, oh, well, let's just adopt a Scandinavian model to the United States. Denmark has four million people. Um, you know, that's that's the population of, of New York City from 34th Street North. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, but, you know, there are a lot of things I'd like to see that I, I just don't. You know, how are we going to get rid of the gun culture in the United States? I mean, this the, the gun situation is just, it's insane. And I just, I see no hope for it right now because they're, they're you know, I, I think that, you know, in terms of policy, I'd like to see, I would like to see a Canadian style healthcare system, which I do, you know, it's, it has its problems, sure. but we're Canadians would they trade their system for the U.S. one? <laughs> I, I doubt it. Um, I would like to, you know, there has to be, I think the, the single biggest pro issue right now is global warming. Um, you right now are getting a little bit of a break this summer. Um, usually we're the ones who, who, you know, you're the ones who have to pay for the wildfires and you know, right now in the Midwest, we're, you know, okay, at the moment we've got good air, but we've had a couple of terrible yeah. um, pollution waves. Now, yeah. I mean, this is not going away. It's only going to get worse. Yeah. The only question is how much worse it's going to get. And I just don't see the level of urgency. And again, this is, you know, you've got these Republicans, they're still yeah. pushing oil. You know, it's just, in, these people have kids and grandkids they don't they care about them i mean it's insane so yeah i would if i yeah if i were dictator um and could do exactly what i wanted i would probably you know i'd try to I'd f the first thing i would try to do is make sure that every single american was guaranteed health care um but and, look, and the second thing i would do is i would make a you know i would in i would institute an all-out effort to address global warming not only domestically, but globally, because it's a global problem. Those are the first two things. After that, um, I don't know. I think a lot of the social and cultural issues are, as I put it to a BBC reporter, they're smoke screens. I mean, they're not really, 
what are we fighting over transgender rights? You're talking about a, a 0.4% of the population that actually is transgender to begin. It's just, but it people, it occupies people's energy and it diverts our attention to the issues that I think are much more significant. But the truth is I'm much less sure that I would know exactly what to do today than I was 30, 40 years ago. So sorry to disappoint you, but. I was, yeah, I was hoping right. you had some, some answers on how to cure polarization. Um, yeah, I see. I think the polarization is a symptom. I think that we need, if we fixed, again, I think if we, if we could fill the center right space of the, of the political spectrum and move the Republican party back towards some degree of sanity. Um, I think a lot of these polarization issues would disappear, not completely. And, and again, you know, again, I, in my day-to-day -day life in the university, I am not happy. I do not like what I see. Um, and part of it is, you know, I think it may be a generational thing. People in my, in my generation, I think are, even those who were on the left, uh, are concerned by some of the uh, lack of tolerance that they see and some of the closed-mindedness. So I'm, you know, yeah, I, I would like to address those issues as well. But but I don't think, you know, I, I think that we have bigger issues we have to solve before we can worry about the, um, you know, who's upset about gay people and who's upset about abortion. I just think that. Sure, sure. But we can't solve any issues anymore these days, basically. And it is because people are so culturally ripped apart. So yeah. I hear you. Climate change is a real issue. Um Transgender people coming and replacing you is not, although a lot of people on the right feel that way. It's not a real issue. It's just kind of a scare tactic. Uh, at the same time, until we get the polarization under wraps, we're not going to be doing anything on climate change or gun control or any of these other social issues. I mean, America's basically stalled on all these things. The least productive Congress we'd seen, I sense, since the 1930s was Obama's, uh, not by his fault, but by the Republican um obstructionist and then it's only gotten worse since then so i mean biden's tried to do a little bit to pull people back but biden trying to unify the country uh you know he said uh, let's all get together you had the republican party initially condemn january 6th and then universally walk it back and that was after biden's trying to bring us all together that that doesn't look like success i'm not blaming biden but i wouldn't call that mission accomplished so i'm questioning how do we actually end the polarization so that we can get things together? Because a lot of uh, people who study government are saying phrases like least productive Congress ever in decades. And then again, and then again, and then again. So it's not working and we can't deal with these issues until we get this fixed. So how okay. do we fix again, I would say, uh, I, I think, and a lot of people would disagree, particularly on the left would strongly disagree with me about this. But I stand by my position. I think that the group that has the greatest potential to address this issue is the big business community, that, that they need to get their act together to start looking at the longer term implications of the situation. Stop worrying about another tax cut for a few more billion that they're not even going to notice. And reoccupy that center right space in, in the political spectrum and regain control of the Republican Party and begin to move them closer to the center. I think that's that's what I see as the best hope for reducing the polarization. But, you know, and I do think that there are elements of the big business community that are th thinking this way and are open to these kinds of suggestions. But it's yes. And it's a but it's a very uh, big job. The the community is much more fragmented than it was back in the mid 20th century when, um, you know, when they were able to do these things. And the argument right. I make in this article here and also in my book is I, I present chapters and chapters of evidence of the kinds of things that the big business community did that, you know, back when I was in graduate school and I was a much further to the left and we hated those, you know, all these corporate elites, they're yeah. the bad guys, they're ruining everything. But, you know, you look back on what on it now compared to the people today and they actually, you know, they were much more um, 
socially conscious in a way that I think, sure, they were, they were protecting their own interests as they saw them, but they operated with this conception that they called enlightened self-interest. Mm. You know, mm. in, in order to preserve our benefits, we have to have a, the society has to rest on a strong foundation. Right. And right. you don't see that today. Today, they're basically just hoarding everything for themselves. And it's, so my suggestion is, um, you know, I never thought that big business people were really going to read this or that this was going to have any impact. But, I, you know, that's when you write something like this, you hope that it will reach people. And it did reach some. That's how I got invited to to write that paper for the Niskanen Center. Their, their president at the time had read my book and, and uh, asked me to write that essay and direct it to business people. And the that's idea how I found was, you. Um, yeah, I know. And, yeah. and, you know, the idea being, look, this is what your predecessors did half a century ago. If you, this is what you need to do now. That's what I was trying to argue. And again, right. who's going to listen to me? But, but you know, but we're it's all a good trying, idea and we're out of solutions and yeah, things are getting worse. And solutions. these business leaders still live in America and they got eyeballs. They've got to be noticing things burning down around them That's and right. things not getting better. I mean, you, you have to be, blind or in a cave or in a coma to not get that things are getting bad. And so I'm wondering, are they going to realize, oh, I'm the solution? Oh, I didn't know that. I'm wondering, it. do you think business people know that they're the solution and they just don't want to? Or do they think this is a new idea to them? Maybe they forgot this history you're talking about. Oh, yeah. I don't think they know this history at all. That's okay. why I wanted to point this out to them. Okay. So it would be fair to say. Yeah, I don't think, okay. I really don't think they have an awareness of what they would be capable of doing if they could get their act together. And what I was hoping to do with this study is say, look, this is what you got, your equivalents did back in the 1950s and 60s. And the world was a much better place. Well, I mean, the world was a right. Yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to turn this into some kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. You know, there were there were aspects of our society at that time that including the political system that did work well and worked in ways that that our system does not function into with today. And so, you know, certainly as a at least a partial model of how they might be able to have influence. And um, you know, I'm, I don't see why they would not want to have an impact if they could. And, but I, I don't think they are aware of this history at all. That's my sense. All right. Well, we've seen businesses take uh, some sort of awareness that they need to be on the right side of social issues. Certainly seen that. But we've also yeah, social seen social issues, but not social issues. Right. Uh, but we've also seen, um, you know, Trump was the president from business. Right. And he was the most polarizing guy ever. So I'm wondering what messages the business crowd is getting. They did not support Trump initially. Okay. And, um, yeah, they were not a single top 100 company was supportive of Trump initially when he ran in 2000. They wanted Jeb Bush. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in 2016. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, they're already, even, even um, the Coke, Charles Coke, you know, they're not the Koch brothers anymore because um, one of them died, David right? David passed, yeah. But but they're trying to stop Trump in 2024. They, you know, and they're about as far right as you can get in the business community. So I don't think they, they I do think they want the Republicans. Uh, I don't think they want Trump. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, last question. Yeah. Are the people, you already gave an answer. Uh, but I just wanted to bring this up again. It's not just the political elites. The people themselves are actually polarized. I think you were talking about people that want to date outside of their party anymore. Uh, the evidence seems to suggest that, yes, the degree of polarization in the general public is far greater than it was in earlier decades. Yes. Okay. I just, because there's some professor saying the people aren't polarized. How do we know that? We have a bunch of opinion polls. And when we ask them, do you want your kids not shot in school? 70% say yes. And do you believe that women should have the right to an abortion? 65% say yes. And 
do you want uh, the earth to not, you know, die? 70% say yes. And they have these opinion polls. And so therefore we can conclude that because the public generally agrees or the majority of them seem to agree certain policy issues, there's no real policy difference. There's no polarization. It's just a TV narrative. Yeah. Okay. So what's going on there is that, uh, and again, this is my understanding of the evidence that's been accumulated, is that it's not about, the, the polarization is not really about attitudes per se. It's about identities. So people identify, they see themselves as I am a Republican. That means I hate Democrats. Most Republicans will tell you they want background checks, you know, for gun purchases. Most Republicans will tell you they think taxes are too low. The tax system's unfair in favor of rich people. But it doesn't mean anything because it has no impact on how they're going to vote. If what people say, you know, you can show a statistical association. Yes, people who say abortion should be legal are more likely to vote for Democrats than for Republicans. People who say we should tax the rich are more likely to vote for Democrats. But there are lots of Republicans who say we should tax the rich, but they still vote for Republicans. So th that's the problem. It's not the attitudes, responses to these questions per se. It's how people see their own political identities. And those tend to be very fixed. And then... Um, and and the the attitudes and the identities are often developed as oppositional. So you ask a lot of Republicans, well, we hate Democrats. They care more about Joe Biden losing next year than whoever wins for the Republican. Right. 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 And, you know, certainly the Democrats right now, what a majority of the Democrats don't even want Biden to run next year. But yeah, you can be sure that when the election comes around, they will all be voting for Biden because they're terrified of Republicans getting in. And so I, you know, you're right about the attitudes and responses to specific questions, but I don't think that's what's driving politics right now. Thank you. That's a, it's a debate. And then you really helped clarify that. Okay. Uh, last two questions. You're not you, you're not me. You're a third party person who's watching this video. And they said, wow, that was a great video. I learned a lot, a lot of stuff I didn't know, real insight, never heard about the corporation angle. Um, and there was a lot of material, and I'm struggling to remember it, but there was this one thing that the professor said, and it's five days after I've watched that video. And while I struggle to remember all the content of the video, this one thing the professor said sticks with me. In fact, I can't even stop thinking about this one thing the professor said. What is that one thing you want a random person you'll never meet? to not be able to stop thinking about five days from now? I would say that's a tough one. <laughs> about well, polarization, about polarization. I think the key thing is this point I was making about the center right space in our political spectrum being empty and that it needs to be occupied. And the group that needs to occupy it to step forward, love them or hate them is the big business community that that's the role that they need to play and that that could have a significant impact, I believe, in beginning to reduce the polarization we see. Okay. Uh, I hope you felt this was a fair interview. It wasn't gotcha journalism. We didn't put words in your mouth. You got to say your piece. Oh, absolutely. I, I really enjoyed this. You told me a half hour. We've we've been on for 73 minutes. I, I'm sorry. My no, no, it's secret. It, it felt like a half hour. I mean, we hey, hey, hey. when you're having fun. So I feels like you know, I really enjoyed this. Uh, you don't have to name anybody, but we like to keep the conversation going. Um, do you know anybody who might be willing to be part of an honest conversation? They could be an academic or just an activist. They could be on the left. They could be on the right. Um, well, if you can get him, uh, you probably would want to talk to my colleague, Jerry Davis. Okay. Uh, that's it's Jer Jerry with a J, but his his formal name is Gerald with a G. Okay. Um, Jerry is uh, not only an incredible scholar and brilliant and uh, original and creative, he's also probably the funniest person I've ever. He's a born stand-up. Um, 
It just comes out of him. You will not be able to keep from laughing, but you will learn a ton. Uh, he's very, very busy. He's traveling everywhere. But uh, yeah, he's the first person I would I would want to hear speak. I mean, I've heard him a million times. I'm not going to learn much new at this point, but uh, it would be a real treat for your listeners. And I think you'd greatly enjoy talking to him as well. Found him. I'm definitely going to reach out to him. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, I will email you a copy of this video in a little bit. And I really appreciate you coming out. Was there anything you wanted to talk about or any questions that you had or statements you wanted to say and you felt you didn't have the opportunity to make? Not really. I was a little surprised. This is on, what we're saying now is not going to be on the. Table. This is still live. This is still oh. live. Sir. Oh, it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the discussion took a turn that I didn't expect initially because we were getting into a lot of talk about, you know, when you really got into the nuts and bolts about the yeah. we were talking about, uh, a lot of cultural issues and things that I didn't intend to discuss when I came on. Uh, I didn't say anything that I feel, uh, you know, I would need to recant or anything. You know, I'm not. No, no, no. no. Not about anything I said, but it wasn't. And, you know, that wasn't the direction I expected the discussion to. Right. Take. Right. It was perfectly fine. So, but I did push it back toward the the business angle. It, yeah. On, so. That's that's totally fair. I wanted you on to talk about the article. What happened was you were very good at answering some very large, long running questions. You know, is it A, is it B, is it C or is it D? And I like talking to people who can help give me some clarity. Like there's people saying uh, we're polarized. There's people saying we're not polarized because we have national opinion polls. And you go, well, OK, here's how both could be true. And here's how that could work out in the same reality. That kind of insight and creative thinking is exceptionally illuminating when trying to understand this complex problem. And I really appreciate you being willing to step outside the box a little bit and answer those questions. It, it helps a lot, especially to the public. This is not a well understood topic and certainly not in detail by the average public. It's well understood by academics who research it, but I'm finding the average public, when you really get into like, Try to get the average public to know the difference between political polarization and affective polarization, a basic concept in the space, and they have no idea what you're talking about. So I really appreciate you being willing to break it down, break it down. I think it's this. I think it's this. And you were operating both as an American living with everybody and separately also as an academic. And uh, that's what we did. That's why I did that. And I, it's just valuable information. We just don't have a lot of people saying this we don't have a lot of people acknowledge we don't have a lot of people even acknowledging yeah it's mostly on the right but there is some room on the left for improvement i almost don't see that anywhere and so to actually see somebody who's researched in the topic go yeah duh that's only logical it's exceptionally helpful there's a lot of confusion in the space and there's a lot of just ignorance of the public and uh, there's there's big questions in this field they can't even answer amongst themselves so there's no agreement on is it the just the elites that are polarized or is it the public that are polarized too? If you look at the literature on political polarization, there's a massive divide in the academic field between those two opinions. And so if the academics who are experts are debating a topic and can't come to a conclusion, what chance does the lay public have? Yeah, that's, that's basically what I'm getting at. So thank you so much for being willing to participate. And I Really appreciate your flexibility. Okay, and thank you for having me. I'll email you shortly, and thank you again, Professor. Okay, take care. Bye.